Hey, so as part of an in-depth review I'm making on makeuseof.com, we're looking at the Velatric Nomad 1 e-bike. In this video, I'll be sharing the shipping, unboxing, and installation process, as well as giving you my first impressions riding the bike. Again, I have a more detailed article and video review coming out on makeuseof.com, but in this one, I just wanted to share my quick first impressions. So Velatric offers two main styles of bikes, the Nomad 1, and the Discover One. The Nomad One, which we've got, has the fat tires and it's more of an off-road and capable heavy-duty bike, whereas the Discover is going to be more of a classic road bike. And both bikes are offered in high step or step through variations. I personally thought Mango looked the coolest, so I went with that color, but it's also offered in Cyan, Sky Blue, and Spring. While the high step model might make the bike a little bit more durable, especially if you plan on taking this off-road, I personally decided to go with the step through model as I like the idea of using the bike for adventuring and getting on and off more easily. Although it's high step might make the bike a little bit more capable, I don't really plan on pushing this bike too hard off road. If on the other hand you think that's something you might do, you might prefer the high step model instead. The Nomad 1 easily reaches its top speed of 20 miles per hour. It's a class 2 bike with 5 levels of pedal assist. It also has a throttle mode, meaning it can power itself completely on its own without any pedaling. It also has a walk mode which helps you push the bike with the help of e-assist. This bike weighs 73 pounds and has a max payload of about 440 pounds. These are 26 by 4 inch puncture resistant tires. Its seats are extremely comfortable as they're 220 millimeters wide and have lots of cushion. This bike uses a Shimano 8-speed drivetrain and it has 180 millimeter hydraulic disc brakes. Compared to other similarly priced e-bikes, this has an additional gear and it has those hydraulic brakes compared to the traditional cable actuated ones. Its front forks are 80 millimeters, which makes it great for off-roading as well as absorbing bumps on regular roads. Sitting on the Nomad 1 is extremely comfortable. You have a rather upright seating position, and its swept back handlebars with ergonomic grips make it easy to hold on to and reach. With a big heavy box that's shipped around the world, I'm always interested in the condition that it arrives in. With the exception of a few minor tears on the side, the box looks pretty good. We're gonna start by clipping its five plastic straps. With its two top latches, I figured I'd open the top of the box next, and then lift it vertically. The bike is really well padded and wrapped throughout. From its top, you won't find any of its tools or quick start guides, instead it's at the bottom. This isn't immediately clear, but they probably intended for you to open the box from its side, rather than from its top like we do. If you have a second pair of hands, it's actually easier to lift the bike out rather than rip or cut the side of the box, so this might be a better solution anyways. To better protect the bike as you're installing the different parts, you can keep the protective material on until you reach the step that requires you to remove it. The included tool bag has everything you'll need to complete the installation, though if you have a good set of tools, you might prefer to use those anyways. That said, if you want to have an emergency kit that you always carry along with you, it might be a good idea to take along. The quick start guide is relatively easy to follow along with, with large images and diagrams, but there were a few steps that were a little bit confusing, as I'll mention. The first is actually these plastic covers on each end of the wheel. What's not immediately clear is that there are nuts underneath that you want to retain. Attached to the top of your front wheel is the mud guard, which we'll remove with a few screws and by releasing the strap. Similar to other bikes, you'll align your front wheel, fitting it in between the brakes. We end up re-screwing on that protective plastic cover just a little bit in order to remove the nut that's underneath, as we need that to secure the front wheel on. Front wheel alignment seems to be pretty good as the wheel spins freely and doesn't seem to have any issues. So we then proceed to tightening it with the wrench. Installing the front mug guard is an easy process as it just requires one screw at the top and then one screw for each of its arms on its side. Another weird quirk though with its instructions and something that isn't immediately clear is that we'll actually need to remove that top screw again in order to install the front light later. And you'll see what I mean when we get to that step. The screws are pre-installed in the bike so you will need to loosen and remove them first in order to install the arms for the mudguard. Next we're installing our handlebar, which involves us removing these four screws to release this top cover. Yep. 
As you can see, you now have this perfect alignment that's easily viewable. Next, we're installing the display. With its single clip, you can easily mount it to either side of your handlebars, and you also have a lot of flexibility with its orientation and angle too. There's just one screw holding this in, so make sure you tighten that properly. We then have one blue and one green wire that we need to connect. You'll notice that there are weather seal covers above each of them. All you do is snap them into place with a little bit of force and they'll stay connected. Its rear light is battery powered and requires its rubber spacers in order to fit on properly without sliding off. Clicking it once will either turn it on or off. But depending on how low you want your seat to go, you might want to be careful about where you place the rear light as it can obstruct the seat from reaching its lowest height. Your pedals will come wrapped together in plastic. Illustrated on each side is an easy diagram to follow so you know which way to tighten for each pedal. You can then tighten it further with the wrench. It's at this point now that we're installing the front light. And as I mentioned earlier, we have to remove the top screw from the front mud guard in order to install our light. And it's just a minor inconvenience that could be fixed by slightly better instructions. With our light secured and similar to the top display, we'll then connect the light to the rest of the bike using this one cable. The battery arrives semi-installed into the frame of the bike, though there are a few protective pieces preventing the leads from connecting, as well as the battery bumping against the rest of the frame. Once removed, the battery easily clicks into place, though it might require an extra push in order to secure it properly. Perhaps most confusing is that the instructions only tell you to install the kickstand near the very end. It actually would have made installation of the rest of the steps a lot more easy had this been one of the earlier things they asked you to do. And this would have been especially true if only one person was installing the bike. At this point, according to the instructions, we're done, but we still have the reflectors and the bell to install. And although we don't have instructions to follow, they are intuitive enough to install on our own if we want. With the setup done, it was time for my first ride. Again, with its class two throttle assist and five power modes, the bike feels extremely quick and very torquey. You can quickly see from my face just how much fun I was having. At times, it honestly felt like it was a little 50cc scooter and it can almost go nearly as fast. Riding this around the neighborhood, this was more than enough power. I was actually able to easily merge onto the main street with other cars and I was also able to quickly cross over to the other side of the road and get to the bike path when I needed to. It might take a little bit of getting used to to figure out which combo of gears and power assist mode you should be in, but when you do, the bike is able to go up hills, even steep ones, with a breeze. And like we were saying, you can even use it in its walk assist mode to help you push the bike along more easily. I did notice, however, that the throttle tends to be quite aggressive and isn't really that smooth. Using the throttle assist at lower speeds or when you're slowly accelerating does require a little bit more feather-like input, though it can be very easy to press too hard and cause the bike to accelerate a little bit more quickly than you'd like. This might not make it an ideal choice for more technical trails and riding, but then again, that's not what this bike is really intended to, despite those fat tires. This is one area where a significantly more expensive e-bike will still feel more refined. However, for more general off-roading, the bike still has plenty of power, is extremely fun, and will keep you going for miles effortlessly. Competing models with similar specs often cost more, and while the Velatrek might be a newer e-bike company, it's clear that they're focusing on providing a high quality and reliable bike with a premium design and build. For most riders, this bike will be more than enough for all riding conditions, whether off or on road. It's quick, fast, and again, very fun. To learn more about this bike and my experience, you can stay tuned for my full review on makeuseof.com. Until then, I'll catch you in the next one.